The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show. I'm Charles Christian and thank you very much for tuning in again. This week we have the third and final part of our interview with Terry Lovelace about the UFO abduction experience he calls the Incident at Devil's Den. We're also looking at some of the weirder conspiracy theories now springing up about the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic. And we're starting a new mini-series on fabulous creatures from the world of folk, lore and legend. Let's talk about conspiracy theories. Not something we normally do on this show, as uh, many of them are completely wacko. Now, coronavirus, or COVID-19, has become the focus of attention and a conspiracy theory, or maybe two, are now emerging as to uh, whether the virus was man-made, perhaps as part of a covert germ warfare experiment that somehow escaped into the wild. Hmm? Hello? Could that be China, which was the first country to report the outbreak and, as we now know, initially tried to censor reports of its spread? But, this is where the story gets more complicated, was its escape into the wild accidental or deliberate? And this is where the second thread of the conspiracy theory begins to take off. How come the nations of the West... Europe, the UK, the US, have been so slow in reacting with effective measures and apparently have made no progress on developing a vaccine. Is it because they've been unable to do so or are unwilling to do so? Look at some of these countries. All of them have growing populations of elderly people who are putting increasing strains on the pension systems and the medical social services infrastructures. In Italy, which has the highest mortality rate for coronavirus in Europe, there is a declining birth rate, a growing emigration rate, and also a growing proportion of people living into old age. And they're also living a lot longer. Quite simply, the number of people working and paying taxes is in decline, while the number of people calling on public finances is on the increase. And then there's here in the UK, where elderly people are putting a huge strain on the National Health Service and related care services. Both countries' fortunes would actually benefit if there was a huge cull of the elderly. And, hey presto, here's a handy pandemic to do the job. Hmm. Personally, I don't believe it. All the evidence I've seen suggests the world is ruled by cock-ups rather than conspiracies. I'll put it another way, our governments and politicians aren't clever enough to manage a conspiracy on such a global and diabolical scale. But, hmm. Anyway, let's look at another coronavirus conspiracy that is easier to debunk. According to data gathered by an American tech company called R-Post, 38% of American beer drinkers think the coronavirus stems from drinking corona beer. So I thought I'd do the math, taking into account the total population of the United States, which is about 330 million, the percentage who drink alcohol on a regular basis, 63%, the number of alcohol drinkers who prefer booze to beer, 42%, which comes out to about 87 million people. And then we take the 38% of those who think coronavirus stems from corona beer. And the answer is that a massive 33.2 million US citizens think corona beer is the cause of a global pandemic. 
To set that into a European context, that figure of 33 million is equivalent to the total populations of the countries of Sweden, Belgium, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Monaco and the Vatican City. Now, I mentioned we're starting a new series called Fabulous Creatures. And this is actually based on a uh, column I do on a monthly basis for the Ancient Origins magazine. It appears on there first, and then sometime later I'm going to be talking about the creatures I feature on uh, here on the Weird Tales radio show. And our first creature is the Barveen She, uh, which appears to be spelled Beaban Sith, but I say the correct pronunciation is Barvan She. And this is a demonic femme fatale of the Scottish Highlands. And although the name shares the same Gaelic roots as Banshee, these creatures, always women and always beautiful, and usually with long red hair, are a cross between a vampire and a succubus. And if you don't know what a succubus is, you need a dictionary. Folk tales suggest they're a very dangerous form of night-walking elemental who prey upon lonely men, leaving them dead and drained of their blood before they, the Barvin she, vanish with the dawn. All accounts of the creature share one feature in common. While out on a hunting or cattle-droving trip or moving animal livestocks around and camped out for the night, one or more of the men in a particular party, of drovers and farmers, says he wishes his wife or sweetheart could be with him to keep him company that night. Soon afterwards, and somewhat mysteriously, a group of beautiful women, and also very accommodating women, conveniently appear at the campsite. Typically, they will all be wearing long green dresses that trail along the ground. Why, you ask? To disguise the fact that they are not human and instead of feet, their legs end in the cloven hooves of a deer. In one account, the sole survivor of a group of four men said that as he played the fiddle, while his companions danced with the women, he noticed drops of blood falling from the men. He fled from the hut, They'd been in and spent the rest of the night hidden among the hunting party's horses, which were tethered outside. When the morning came, the Barvan she disappeared, and the fiddler found his companions dead on the ground, their bodies sucked dry of blood. So how did he live to tell the tale? Because although one of the Barvan she saw him leave and chased after him, she could not attack him because he was surrounded by horses which had been shod with iron shoes. It is, incidentally, a common theme in folklore that many forms of malicious elementals are repelled by iron in the same way that silver is said to offer protection against vampires and werewolves. This, incidentally, is one of the reasons why people still nail a horseshoe over the front door, not just to bring luck to the house, but also to protect against evil trying to get in. The Barv and she, therefore, provide a reminder to feckless men. You should always be careful what you wish for. In fact, there is a traditional Scottish belief still in circulation in the early years of the 20th century that if you make a wish at night without also invoking God's protection, then that wish will be granted in a terrible manner. What else can I tell you about the Barv and she? It's said they can shapeshift into hooded crows, also known as the Scotch crow, so a loud cawing and flapping of bird wings may announce the arrival of, or departure of, of a flock of predatory barven and she. Oh yes. And men, just don't be so gullible. If a beautiful young woman in a long green frock suddenly arrives at your campsite in the forest in the middle of the night and offers to dance with you, at least stop and ask yourself, is this plausible, before accepting the offer? (laughs) 
now here's the third and final part of our interview with UFO abductee Terry Lovelace. In this episode, we learn what has happened to him in the years since the abduction in the 1970s, and we also consider whether there is a giant conspiracy, hmm, a second conspiracy this show, between the US government and alien visitors. This major in charge says, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna close your file, son. I don't see any any need for anything further." And I said, "That would make me very happy." Uh, and he says, "You know, um, you may remember some of what you saw." And he says, "And you may have funny dreams, and uh, but nobody needs to know this." He says, "This this is just, you know, it's nobody's business but your own." And, uh, you know, you've signed a non-disclosure agreement that can be enforced under, you know, under penalty of law. You can be uh, sanctioned. You can be fined. You can be in prison. Um, so, you know, forget about it. Forget about it and go on with your life. And uh, that's what I, I tried to do mm-hmm. um, until 2012. Yeah. 2012, when they took those x-rays, and that, that, that just changed the whole equation. I was, I was determined at that point I was going to do everything I could to uh, write a book, to tell the story, to speak publicly. Uh, I just felt I had a duty to do that. And uh, that kind of brings us to today. Yeah. After that, you continued, continued in service for a couple more years. Uh, then you went on to do your psychology degree, then your law degree, and then you went on to your legal career. And yes. you retired in uh, 2012. Yes. That was when you uh, had the pain. Well, some months after you retired, you had the pain. Yes. You say the process of having the x-rays where they were examining your right knee, you think that may have triggered the return of the post-traumatic shock? I, I do. I do. Because that triggered a new round of, I had called them intrusive thoughts. Uh, in 1987, um, my wife and I were Christmas shopping. And that's when I turned the corner and uh, saw these uh, storefront mannequins and just had a meltdown. Yeah. And, uh, and she, you know, she knew at this time I'm having three or four of these screaming nightmares uh, a year. Yeah. Uh, and that eventually calmed down to one or two. But um, she suggested that I talk to a counselor or someone. And uh, I said, you know, look, I'm, I'm not going to tell somebody I saw a UFO. I mean, you know, they're going to think I'm delusional. Yeah. And uh, she said, well, you don't have to tell them that. Tell them that, you know. You went on this camping trip, something happened, and you woke up sick, and uh, you were hurt somehow, and, uh, you know, just leave that part out. Hmm. And I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. So I, I did go, and I talked with a licensed therapist, uh, and she gave me a test. I don't know if it's used in the UK or not. It's called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, or the MMPI, and it's a uh, test with about a thousand questions and the test has been around for 50 years or more and the validity of the test is well established Mm -hmm. how you answer the questions um you know can pretty much diagnose uh what's going on with you and uh, i was diagnosed as having post-traumatic stress disorder you know, uh, I had had these, I called them intrusive thoughts, um, where I would be doing something totally unrelated. I'd be, you know, I'd be in court, I'd be reading a book, I'd be watching television with my wife, and images of this craft would just flash into my mind um, without a conscious thought on my end. And they explained to me those are flashbacks. And that's a common symptom of PTSD. Mm -hmm. So um, the the diagnosis was PTSD, etiology unknown. Yeah. (laughs) Because I couldn't tie it to a a single traumatic event in my life. Yeah. Taking it forward to 
Now, you started writing your book. When did you start writing your book then? Which? I, I started assembling the notes in 2014. Um, and I, I um, was having, having some trouble coming to grips with it and really sitting down and doing it. Um, and uh, so really 2017 is when I took all the notes I, I was methodical throughout this whole process because I didn't know if they were, I was going to be charged with a crime or not. I got um, just loose leaf binder notebooks, notebooks, notebooks like, you know, kids take to school. Yeah. And I, I recorded everything that happened uh, with as much detail as I, as I could make. And I drew a picture of what we saw. And uh, recorded everything and filled about four and a half notebooks. And um, fortunately, my wife saved those notebooks. And she flew to a storage locker that we have in Michigan and retrieved them and yeah. brought them back home. And that gave me uh, the details. Uh, my memory was pretty clear, but uh, a lot of the fine details, you know, people were curious, well, how can you remember this stuff so clearly? Well, I, I didn't actually. I, you know, I relied on notes that were contemporaneously made, you know, during the event. Yeah. And uh, I got to say this, that, um, oh, for the sake of clarity, real quick, uh, I should add that when I went to the emergency room with knee pain, I had a cyst underneath my kneecap. The pain that I had in my knee was in no way affiliated or, or no way caused by the implants in my leg. That, that, that's how they were discovered. Yeah. Uh, but, but they weren't the cause of my pain or discomfort. That was yeah. a Baker cyst that uh, yep. uh, resolved on its own. Yes. Yeah. Now, when you had the x-rays, what type of things did they see in your leg then? Was it just one metal thing or was there something else there? There, there, there were two things. Um, and I asked the radiologist, I said, look, you know, I, uh, and I have been in my legal career, I was involved in, in some medical things. So I'm comfortable around medical people. Um, and having been trained as a medic, I got, I got some knowledge of anatomy and physiology. I'm certainly no physician, but yeah. Um, and I said, you know, could I could I see my X-rays? And uh, he said, sure. And uh, he popped them up on the on the on the view box, the first one. And I didn't see it at first, um, but once he pointed it out, I mean, you didn't need a medical degree to see it. It was a square object. I think I sent you a photograph of it. Yeah. About the size of a fingernail with two wires attached. Uh, and those wires go up my leg. And I have no idea how far up they went. Um, and uh, he said that's, that's really the item that, that caused him to do the um, examination of my knee looking for a, a scar. And he was clearly unsettled by the lack of a scar. Yeah. And he said, there's uh, something else I want to show you. And he showed me the thing that looks like a thing above my knee that looks like electrical device of some kind. That was taken from an x-ray of my leg from the, you know, position head on. Mm -hmm. what they call AP, anterior, posterior. Yeah. Uh, that was a straight on shot. And then there was a second x-ray um, where they had my leg bent and sideways on a, um, on a, on a plate mm -hmm. and, uh, inside my calf muscle, there's an arrangement of a uh, bone that form almost like a floral type pattern. Uh, I think there's five of them with like a little dot of, of tissue in the middle. And he showed me those and I thought, you know, I was shocked to see that because I, 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 I knew that, you know, there are no bones in your calf, the calf of your leg. Yes. And uh, I said, well, doctor, what are those? And he says, I, from the x-ray, they are about the, um, about the uh, same density as bone tissue. 
And then he said something funny. He said, but I think not. And I said, what do you mean you think not? And he said, I, um, I've never known bone tissue to spontaneously sprout in the middle of a muscle, much less arrange itself in a symmetrical pattern. He said, I've just never seen this before. Uh, and that did nothing to put my mind at ease. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Then the next stage in the story is really October 2017. It is. Oh, before they get there, before I get there, I do want to say one thing, and that is that, because people want to know, why didn't you have these things taken out and examined? Yeah. And uh, mm. believe me, I wanted them out of my leg. Uh, for some reason, the one on top of the leg bothered me more than the one on the bottom, I guess because the ones on the bottom could be bone or something, but the yeah. one on top was clearly a manufactured structure. It wasn't yeah. anything organic in nature, and I wanted that out of my leg, out of my life, uh, and I wanted it examined, you know, and I went to see uh, some surgeons. I went to, and they were like, fine, yeah, they, they, they were enthusiastic, actually. They wanted it out to see yeah. it. And, um, but because I'd had a heart attack in 2005 and a stent put in my heart in 2011, they said that, you know, that I needed to have a cardiac clearance letter. In other words, right. a cardiologist yeah. has to review and, and say that I'm healthy enough for the, uh, for the procedure. Yes. And I couldn't, I couldn't get anyone to do it. I talked to three, uh, cardiac cardiologists within the VA system and at great expense, too, uh, in the civilian system. And uh, no one would give me a cardiac clearance letter. And that's the standard of care. And if you think about it, I guess from their vantage point, it makes sense. If you have these things inside you, and they're benign, and yeah. they're not causing you any trouble, yeah. the risk of a surgery mm -hmm. outweighs the benefit of having the things removed. Yes. So that's that's why they remained in my leg. Yeah. Uh, until later, and I'll get to now. Let's fast forward to October 2017. I, uh, I'm, I'm writing my book, and um, I have a, I, I have it nearly finished, and uh, you know, and, and tried to be as uh, true to the, to all the facts as possible. And I was considering going to Mexico. Um, and having a, a Mexican surgeon remove the thing above my knee. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually talked to a surgeon down there and sent him the x-rays. And he said, you know, cardiac clearance letter, come on down, I'll do it for you. Mm -hmm. And um, we were making plans for that, actually. And this night, my wife and I had been to a movie and we didn't see anything, you know, UFO related or science fiction related. I don't know what we saw. It may have been a comedy. Um, we watched a motion picture, came home, got home. What's late for us, about 11 in the evening. And, um, you know, I locked up the house like I, like I normally do and uh, set the alarm and uh, went to bed. Yeah. And a few hours later, I woke up. I open my eyes and I'm sitting bolt upright in my living room. Now, I've never sleepwalked uh, in my life. And I'm confused about where I'm at and why I'm there. Yeah. Um, and then I felt that familiar feeling of calm wash over me again. Um, you know, I didn't, I saw seated across from me a petite Asian woman dressed in black, with a black wig and black glasses. Sturdy, uh, like nursing shoes with about a two inch heel to add some height to her. Uh, and those were black as well. And she had long sleeves to cover four long fingers. And this uh, wig was kind of askew on her head and it looked ridiculous. And I, uh, when I saw her, like I said, I wasn't panicked. I never thought to trip the alarm or grab a firearm or do anything of the sort. Um, and I, I had the thought, are you here about the thing in my leg? 
And she fired back at me telepathically and said, yes, I am. That's the reason that I'm here. And I had the thought cross my mind, I wish she would remove those glasses. And mm. she, she did so immediately. And on closer inspection, I could see she was not a human being. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, the way she was dressed, she could have probably walked the streets of, uh, of uh, you know, of, of London or Manchester and, and not drawn a second look. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, on close inspection, you could see that she was not human. And the wig is sitting on her head askew because there's this bulbous back part of her of her skull it's um, too big for the wig. Yeah. And uh, she looked familiar. And, you know, they, they, I had memories of being taken as a child. And uh, I recognized her as a child. Uh, I called her Sue. Um, there was a, you know, when I'm between the ages of four and, and seven, they used to periodically take me. And um, um, I remembered her. Yeah. Uh, she looked familiar. As a matter of fact, it crossed my mind. My God, it's good to see you again. And she fired back, it's good to see you, Terry. Um, and, you know, I might make a point. And, there, you know, there's a good reason why human beings don't communicate telepathically. And that is we're not we're not ready to do that yet. We're not we're not evolved to that level. Um, I had the thought, she knows my thoughts. What if I think of something inappropriate? What if I think of something that makes her angry? Mm -hmm. And of course, the second I had that thought, every single combination of anything that was inappropriate flashes through my mind. Yep. Yep. And I have no control over it. Yeah. And she looks a bit embarrassed, actually, and says, Terry, you can control your thoughts and keep some of them private. Now, I don't know if that's true or if that was said to put me at ease, um, but it did somewhat. Yeah. And uh, she said the, the thing above your knee was placed there by, she said, my host, H-O-S-T-S. Mm-hmm. You know, a host you know, can be a noun, like a, the host of a dinner party, or it could be a verb, like if you host a dinner party, by yep, yep. creating one, putting one on. And uh, uh, I just thought it was an odd use of words. And uh, she picked up on that. And she said, you call them aliens. I call them my host because they're not alien to me. Right. Which I thought was kind of a, <laughs> you know, a poetic way of saying that, I know these these things. Yeah, these these entities. I know them. Um, and she said that they will not allow you to have this thing removed from your leg and have it fall into the hands of terrestrial scientists. She said that simply cannot happen. And I, my thought was, well, you know, how are they going to stop me? Mm-hmm. And she fired back and said, they'll come and they'll retrieve it in the middle of the night. And she said, and they won't hurt you in the least, but they'll take they'll take back their property. And um, the next thing I know, I wake up and it's in the, in my, in the morning and, and I'm in bed and I wrote all this down, what I could remember, because I knew it wasn't a dream. And um, three weeks later, I woke up with this terrible pain uh, in the top of my legs, both legs. Yeah. Um, the bruising would come later, but that morning when I woke up, I had these puncture marks at the top of my leg, well, one on top of each. Now, the, the implants were down near my knee, mm-hmm. so I had no idea why they would put the um, puncture thing up top. But, of course, I don't know how far up my leg those wires went either. Yes. Um, the things below my knee are still there, have been untouched. Um, I've had them tested and they're, they, they are magnetic. Uh, they have a magnetic field around them. Um, so I, I don't know what they are, but they're still in me. Yeah. So 
I told my wife, I woke up that morning in pain and she said, you know, what happened to you? And I said, I think I know what happened to me. I think they came and they got their merchandise last night. And I said, I need to find an x-ray. I need somebody to give me an x-ray. I want to know. So I, uh, I had some copies of my x-rays on, uh, on, you know, just on paper, yeah. on, on yeah. copy paper. I took them with me and I drove around. You know, you can't go to a radio radiology. There's, there are freestanding radiology clinics, but they won't x-ray you on request. You, you need a doctor's yes. prescription, a, a doctor's note. Yes, a reference, and yes. I went to a, a chiropractor's office um, and uh, I didn't have an appointment and I waited to see the, the doctor. And finally, after about 45 minutes, and he was very busy, he called me back and he said, okay, where do you hurt? And I said, well, I hurt here at the top of my legs. And, uh, and he looked and uh, I had these extra copies of x-rays in my hands. Now, you know, I, I knew or know that chiropractors look at x-rays, you know, a hundred to a hundred a week. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. And he said, well, I'll pay for your x-ray and I'll tell you where to go, but I want to see your x-ray. And the only thing I ask is that you not use my name or my clinic's name in your book. And I said, fair. Now, this, this guy, he's either had an experience himself or in the course of what he does, he's seen other people and knows that this is a real phenomenon because he was not skeptical in the least. He was 100% empathetic. And uh, I got the x-ray and took it home and put it, my wife and I put it up against the window. And sure enough, the thing above my knee and lateral is gone. Mm -hmm. And I dropped the x-rays off at his office and uh, he called me that evening and he asked me, he says, well, did you see your x-rays? And I said, well, I did. I see that the object is gone. And he says, well, did you see that they left you something? And I said, no. And uh, he said, you know, and I, and I got a copy of, of the x-ray later. I would get a copy. But he said, parallel to my femur, there are two tiny wires, uh, about a centimeter long, about a quarter inch long or a little longer. Um, and they're lying next to one another. At first glance, they look like one object, but if you look close or if you use a magnifying glass, you can see they are two tiny wires separated by just the, the you know, fraction of a millimeter. And I said, doctor, you know, if these, if these beings are so far evolved, you know, if they're so much above us intellect wise, how could they be so inept as to leave these two wires in my body? And he said, you know, kind of with authority, he said, they're not inept. He said, they just gave you an upgrade. He said, they took out the 2017 model and left you with a 20, or pardon me, the 1977 model they took out and left you with the new 2017 version. He said, I, I, I don't believe they do anything on accident. Mm -hmm. So those two little wires are still in my leg. Um, you know, I, you know, it, it's almost like I wish I hadn't seen them on the x-ray. Um, and I have no thought of having them removed. Uh, you know, it, it is what it is. I, I think if I tried to have them removed, I think they'd intervene again in yeah. some way. So, um, you know, I, I'm just going to live with it. But, you know, I want to tell the story because I think the world should know that this stuff is real. Yeah. I think that's important. Uh, because uh, they're going to become known someday. Yes. And people need to be prepared for that because that day is coming. Mm. I believe that that day of disclosure is coming. I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime or after, but uh, eventually it, it, it's going it's going to be there. Yeah. Now, the next step is 2018. 
when in March your book Incident at Devil's Den is published and um, we will give a mention of it later on but uh, it's available on Amazon in paperback, Kindle and audiobook. The book was published and what happened after the book was published? A lot of strange things. Um, first of all, uh, and the book really took off. I, I sold an awful lot of books, and it was an Amazon bestseller. Uh, it still bounces back and forth out of the top 100 in genre, you mm-hmm. know, out of 37,000. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, it it sounds cliche. It really does. It sounds like something out of a movie, but it's, it's swear to God that it's true, and that is that I had these helicopters flying over my home. Uh, And they usually came between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning. And at that time of day, my field of view was limited to about 180 degrees due to the placement of the sun and a large tree in my front yard. Mm -hmm. So I could see these these helicopters go around, you know, my house and then back and then turn around, come out of the sun and, and continue to make loops. And sometimes they got very close, and sometimes they would just hover above my house. And, you know, and my wife is like, you know, what, did they reroute the traffic copter or something? What, 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 is, what is up with this? And my neighbors are like, you know, these helicopters seem to be, uh, you know, <laughs> centered over your home for some reason. What's going on? Yeah. Uh, and I said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. And so I went out and I started photographing them. And cataloging them by make and model. I, I'm fortunate to have a friend, a good friend. He's a um, and he's a very gifted psychic. He's a um, professor of history at Citrus College in Glendora, California. And he's about my age. And um, he waited until he was about my age to release the fact to the public and admit that he had has lived a life as a psychic. Um, but he's also, before he went to, before he went to uh, grad school, was a helicopter pilot in the United States Army. Mm-hmm. And he's married to a woman who is a helicopter flight instructor. So I sent him, I told him about these helicopters. He said, well, send me what you got. And I sent him all these photographs. And he noticed, well, first of all, he was able to categorize uh, the make and model of each, of each aircraft. Uh, and there were, you know, Robertson R-22, Robertson R-44s, Airbus 350s, and an assortment of military helicopters. Mm-hmm. And um, I've got some good photographs, and, and there are no numbers, you know. And, and I looked up, I know how, I looked up the law under the Federal Aviation Administration, and um, the law clearly states that if you register a helicopter in the United States, it must dis- it must display the alphabetical character N, followed by a numerical stream that identifies that particular craft. Yes. None of these aircraft had any numbers, writings, any markings visible whatsoever. The other thing that they had was what uh, my friend Bruce referred to as a strange light anomaly. There is a... Um, Even though it's bright sunshine in daytime, there's a light shining uh, either from the tail or from underneath the craft. Um, And and he said that that doesn't belong there. Um, And like the uh, photograph of the Airbus 350 had uh, some fins on the back of the the tail and the rotor system was not uh, was not stock. It was custom made somehow. Um, Mm hmm. And, uh, I, you know, it, it, at first it was almost, uh, almost fun. You know, yeah. I'd run out, I'd take photographs, you know, my neighbors are taking photographs. Um, and, uh, but after a while it started to really wear on us. Um, yeah. and, uh, I, I knew that the idea was to intimidate and I, and I, wasn't going to be intimidated, but I guess eventually I was. And my wife and I sold that home and uh, moved. And we moved about eight miles away. 
And the first night in our new home, I knew that they'd be back. I, I, I knew that, you know, wherever we went, they'd make themselves known. And sure enough, uh, on the morning of our first night in our new house, at 9 a.m. on the dot, I heard the familiar thump, 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 thump. thump. I yep. jumped out of bed. I ran outside with my phone. And right 400 feet over our house is this enormous olive drab helicopter uh, right over us. And as soon as I run out of my house and it sees me and I see it, it peels off and, and leaves. Um, and I think that was their way of saying, you know, you know, we, we got our eye on you. We know where you're at. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that activity has died down. Yeah. And uh, it's a rare occasion now uh, that I see one. But uh, occasionally um, I'll have one follow me in my car. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I've also seen some, when I was blowing up these photographs of these helicopters looking for some type of identifier, I often find UFOs in, in the picture with them. And, uh, and that was shocking. Um, and then there were several occasions where I could see with my naked eye um, a saucer-like craft. Yeah. And I, I photographed one. I was coming home from uh, a doctor's office about 10 miles from my home. And I've got a dozen pictures of it, including one where it's uh, sitting above my home, stationary for a few seconds and I happen to get a picture of it. And, um, you know, that, 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 that's, that's kind of a new thing just in the past year. Uh, I've always seen, you know, strange things in the sky, but to see one of these things so clearly, um, yeah. that's new. Yeah. Since then, there was a television TV program last November, I believe, Travel Channel. Yes, yes. November 4th, uh, they filmed me for a show called uh, My Horror Story. Uh, and it's on YouTube or you can go online and find it. Um, yeah. And they did a, a fairly good job. Uh, it's a little bit uh, dramatized. Mm. Uh, it's uh, in my own words, mostly. Um of course, you know, you can't in a in a in a 20 minute segment fill in all the details. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah. And, and uh, A&E, uh, the uh, television network here uh, is coming to my home the third week in March next month, about 30 days from now. Yeah. Or less. And uh, they're bringing a film crew to my home. Um there were, uh, there's an investigator here named Lou Elizondo, who used to work for the federal government and was in charge of the ATIP program, the um, Advanced Aerial Threat uh, Identification Program. Yeah. And uh, he called me up shortly after my book was published. He, Tom DeLong, um, and some other people that are that are well known in the UFO community and affiliated yeah. with To the Stars Academy. Um, and uh, Lou came out and spent two days with me, uh, and I told him my story. And I'm going to retell it to A and E um, mm -hmm. here in a few weeks. Yeah, and the program should be on um, Lou Elizondo's show, The Unidentified. Um, yeah. So we've got that coming up. And you've also got an option on your book for a movie, which may or may not happen in the way of movies, but there's a possibility yes. that may be starting to go into production sometime in a, well, three years' time, January yeah. 2023. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I'm hoping to uh, I'm hoping to see that, but you know, the nature of that industry, I I, uh, I, I think it's a long shot. Yes. To be honest with you. So I'm not I'm not holding my You're breath. Not holding your breath, yeah. Now, um, 
just sort of drawing some strands together, you seem to be implying you think that Earth-based, possibly US-based people, institutions, the military, are not only aware of the UFOs, uh, for want of a better word, but may well be working with them, collaborating with them? Because you mentioned you thought you saw Earth-type people as crew on the ship you were on, and yes. just now you've been talking about the blacked-out helicopters apparently being accompanied by UFOs. You know, I, I have a theory, and I, and I lay that out in my book. I don't know if I articulate it well, but, you know, I think there are three possibilities here. I think that we could be working shoulder to shoulder with extraterrestrial beings towards some kind of shared agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, then I think also, or any alternative, uh, it could be a, um, a quid pro quo where they give us technology and in return we give them the license the, 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 to take a limited number of people for whatever reason per mm -hmm. year mm -hmm. uh, and cattle. And um, the third option or, or third alternative is that these things happen. We know they happen, but we have absolutely no control. Yeah. And I'm inclined to think it's the latter. Um, but I don't know. You know, I know there were human beings aboard that ship. I just don't know if they were human beings from our world or some other world. I, I don't know. Um, and the other thing that's interesting, and you have sent me photos, and we will be putting the photos up on our website, is the Devil's Den today, because you make the point when we were exchanging emails that this clearance in the middle of the woods is still a clearance. It's in the middle of nowhere, and somebody 40 years later still appears to be clear, keeping it clear and having cut and mowed it, and there's no trees there, whereas, you know, normally uh, 40 years, that whole area would be thick in um, saplings, yes. trees and the like. You know, I never bothered to look on Google Earth because I just made the assumption that this place would be covered with 40-year-old mature trees by now. Yeah. Um, but that's not the case. Uh, it, Like you said, it's clear cut. I had a um, – and it's triangular shaped. I described it in my book as being horseshoe shaped, but it's difficult from the ground to make that kind of uh, – Yeah. That kind of – uh, you know, you, you don't have the, the benefit of an aerial view. And uh, but that's definitely the spot. Yeah. And uh, on my Facebook page, Incident at Devil's Den, um, I had a landscaper from uh, Alabama uh, send me a message and say, you know, I, I, I've looked at this and I can see tractor, uh, clear marks of, from tractor tires and he says, that's that's mowed, uh, mowed by tractor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's not a paved road leading up there. Yeah. It's still just a dirt and gravel road. Yeah. So. Yes, I mean, looking on one of the, I don't know if it's a Google Earth picture, um, it definitely looks as if there's the sort of circular marks that a tractor makes when it's, uh, when a mower makes when it's, uh, cleaning an area around, yes. And and I ask myself why? Why would the yes. uh, the bureau? Why would the federal government pay for the gas to, to, and a tractor and the, the labor expense for forty years mm. to cut this uh, to cut this thing? And uh, you know, I uh, I think because it's a landing pad. Yeah, I, it's the only conclusion. What about you going forward? You've mentioned the filming and the movie and various other things. Uh, are you doing any more research or have you any had, more to the point, have you had any more unusual incidents? I had an unusual incident um, on April 16th of 2019. I have a iPhone 
that has what's called a health app on it. Mm -hmm. It measures the steps and the distance that you walk or the flights of stairs that you climb. Yes. And on, I believe I sent copies of that to you. Yes. And on April 16th of 2019, I woke up at 5.55 a.m. And I was out of breath. I was short of breath. Um, I was sweating. My pulse was through the roof. I told my wife, I think I'm having a heart attack, although I had no chest pain. Mm -hmm. So she called an ambulance, and the uh, ambulance got there. My blood pressure was like 220 over 110. Uh, and they took me to hospital and uh, did all the routine things they do for a cardiac patient, you know, cardiac enzymes, uh, EKG, chest X-ray, all those things. And came to the conclusion, well, while, I, while I was there, my pulse rate drops back to normal. My blood pressure returns to normal. And I and I feel fine. Mm -hmm. So they kept me there for observation for about six hours and then said, you know, we, we don't know what you experienced, but... Uh, Whatever it is, it's over now. Um, they thought it could be a panic attack, although they they couldn't explain how I could have a panic attack uh, while sleeping. Yeah. But, yeah. So I got home that evening, and, and I make an effort to walk a mile and a half every day. Yeah. And about 7.30 that evening, I told my wife, I, I feel well enough. I'm going to go walk around the block and get a little exercise. And I pulled out my health app, and I saw that I had climbed six flights of stairs. Yes. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, I, we live in a, in a ranch house in Texas. There are no stairs. <laughs> you know, I, and I thought, wait a minute. And, and I looked at that again and I looked at the time and the time uh, is 5.24 a.m. Yes. I climbed these six flights of stairs. At that time, I was sound asleep in bed with my wife or so I thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I, I looked at the graph and if you look at the graph, the, yeah, the, the Y side, the vertical index, uh, indicates height with each block representing 10 feet. And then the bottom axis that goes across from left to right indicates the passage of time. Yeah. So normally I would climb stairs. I would see as I climb stairs, you know, uh, I don't run up them. You know, as I climb stairs, time passes, and I end up with this stair step type of uh, configuration on my on my iPhone. Mm. I took it to my uh, mobile carrier uh, and to Apple and had it tested. Uh, nothing wrong with the phone. Uh, phone test out just fine. And the lady at Apple told me, she says, well, this is just curious. Uh, it looks like between 523 and 524 a.m., you were 60 feet over your home. And, uh, you know, I've got I've got uh, medical bills from the ambulance in the hospital uh, yeah. to prove my assertion about April 16th, 2019. And uh, I, I think they, they took me. Yeah, uh, I have no memory. I have no memory, no nightmares, no uh, no anything, um, and would not known it had happened. You know, the reason that 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 phone registered that information is because I I, um, I have it in a case that supposedly makes it safe to carry in your breast pocket of your shirt without you know hurting your heart. Yeah, and. Uh, I sleep with a T-shirt with a, with a pocket, and I normally sleep with that in my pocket, hooked up to some headphones, and, and I listen to music. It's how I go to sleep. And uh, when I woke up that morning, it had been unplugged from the wall or ripped out of the wall, uh, you know, and my headphones were on my chest. And I didn't give that a lot of attention because I was more concerned at the time about my health. Yes. But, um, so that, that's the reason that the phone could register that because it was on my person. There's really no answer to that. Well, we, we, you, you, you think, you know, what happened on that? You know, I could have hypnotic regression maybe, and maybe recover what happened. Um, I'm just not sure I'm ready to do that yet. No, I can well understand. Are there any other 
aspects of the story you'd like to mention? I'm conscious of the time. You know, that event of April 16th, 2019, um, was kind of a uh, was kind of a big event. I, I we moved from that home in June, just a couple months later. Um, I can't say that I've had anything of substance really happen, other than uh, you know, occasionally uh, our car will be followed, you know, yeah, by uh, a glowing orb or or a disc or something. Uh, now that's still going on. Just a few weeks back, I drove. Uh, back from, from Houston, back to Dallas, which is about a four hour drive. Mm -hmm. And, um, we had, we had a, um, weird square object, you know, ducking in and out of the clouds that followed us all the way home. So I don't know the reason. I don't know why some people are chosen or picked for this. Um, certainly no honor. Um, I know sometimes I'll see something in the sky and my wife can't see it. Yeah. So I don't know. It's a mystery and maybe beyond my, my ability to comprehend. No, it's very mysterious. And I say the apparent linkage between earth based for the want of a better word, men in black and the aliens does sound very, very mysterious, doesn't it? It certainly is. I think then on, that note, Terry, we say thank you very much for your time. That has been a fascinating talk. Really some good meaty material there. And I wish you well for the future. Well, Charles, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to address your audience and uh, hope one day to make it over to the UK. I'll leave you for the rest of your day. And uh, once again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you again. Time for me to go. Uh, it just remains for me to say thank you very much for listening in and I'll hope you'll join me again same time next week. Till then, this is Charles Christian saying, stay well, stay weird, stay different and don't be embarrassed to wear a face mask out in public or to practice social distancing. It's your life and you only get to live it once. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. You can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Christian Uncut. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Good night. <laughs>